from the New Arts and Media Studios in Milwaukee. I'm Charles Purcell. This is The Log. Well, I'd rather not, but let's, uh, let's talk about this just for a minute anyway. Can we be clear about what's going on with COVID? You don't have to, there's nothing complicated about this. I mean, obviously, yes, it's a complicated issue. But as far as the information we need to make personal decisions, it's really very simple. And it starts with this. Please understand the difference between your personal, private health situation, the choices you make about your own body. All right, that's on one side of the ledger. On the other side is public health. There are two different things. Can we, can we please understand this? And obviously I'm talking right now to the, to the anti-vaxxers. Now you can make all sorts of arguments and a lot of them are actually are pretty good. Yes, you should take care of your own health. Yes. If, if you're health conscious and if you take care of your own immune system, you're going to lessen your odds. You're not going to guarantee your, yourself of anything. But yes, you can reduce the odds of you uh, getting sick from the COVID virus. Yes. There's also just the my body, my choice kind of thing. If I want to take the risk of getting sick, and if, even if I want to take the risk of dying, that's entirely my choice. Don't tread on me. That's also true. But none of that has anything to do with the public health emergency we're currently in. I mean, I'm almost embarrassed to talk about this because it's so obvious, but, but equally as obvious, some of us really need to hear this. And if I could convince just one or two of you out there, simple facts. I'm not pretending to be an expert. I never do. You know me. But the best facts we have from those who know, and it's not controversial, it's a consensus. These are shared opinions by virtually all of those in the know. If you're fully vaccinated, you certainly can still get the virus and pass the virus. That's not up for discussion or debate. That's just a fact. A very small number of those who are double vaxxed can still get sick, can still get very ill, and can even die. Now, it's a very small percentage, and somebody might say, well, I cross the street every day, even though I'm taking my life in my hands. A very small percentage of people are going to get hit by a car. Yeah, I hear you. But again, that is your private decision that has nothing to do with public health. You getting hit by a car isn't going to cause somebody else to get hit by a car. So you choosing still at this point not to get vaccinated, even though there, I will, I will concede this to you. I'm granting this. There are a hundred reasons not to get vaccinated if you're only talking about the personal health side of the coin. Now, I'd still disagree with you, but I, I wouldn't fight with you. I'd still disagree. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about public health. With the Delta variant and with the rise in cases, just oh, here, let's do, here's how I'm doing it. Let me just tell you how I'm going about my day here. I've definitely gone back to wearing a mask all the time when I'm indoors with people I don't know. If it's a private situation, a few people inside a house, people I know, family, close friends, I know for a fact that every, everybody's vaxxed. Then I take off the mask and I relax. If I'm in a store, if I'm in a large crowd, if I, anywhere in public, I'm going to assume that at least half of the people are not masked. And for the sake of just <laughs> playing it safe, I don't know who is and who isn't. So I'm going to assume that you aren't. The person next to me standing in line at checkout, I'm going to assume is not vaxxed. And I'm wearing my damn mask, and I wish they would too. Again, going back to the people who know what they're talking about, this is not from my quote-unquote research. I'm not a researcher. Stop using that word, by the way. 
I, I've seen many people make that comment. And I uh, just had a friend today I was talking to. Anybody who says, I've done research on this, <laughs> or scolds you and tells you to do your own research, that's a red flag that you're talking to a dope. Unless they actually are a researcher and, uh, you know, ask to see their degree. Ask them to see uh, their research work, their papers, their peer-reviewed papers. Ask them about their method. Ask them about their sources. And yes, have you been peer-reviewed? Have you had published articles? Do you, you know? No, you're not doing research. I don't care if you spend five hours a day on the internet looking for every source you can find. That's not research. Stop using that word. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Where was I? Ah, yes, the people who know. A consensus. Not outlier opinions. Not some unsourced weirdo on the web. No. The people who know are telling us that we are in for a shit storm with the COVID. Now, they don't know. They don't claim to know. They do their modeling. You know how all this works. And they're 100% honest when they say. In fact, I've noticed they go out of their way to qualify everything they say. Fauci drives me crazy because he's always so damned uh, careful. He always couches it in this, well, our best guess and the best modeling suggests things like that. And I'm not, I, we can't say for certain what's going to happen, you know, the, the, but there's a real possibility. Uh, in fact, a high probability that we're going to see a huge spike that we've already, we've already seen the beginnings of. You've, you've seen the charts, haven't you? Cases are skyrocketing. They're absolutely skyrocketing. In some parts of the country, hospitals are already running out of beds and running out of personnel and running out of PPE, just like in the bad old days. We're already there. And what they're telling us is this might well, in fact, probably will spike again as the summer progresses into fall. And by mid-October, we could be right back where we started. Now, the difference here, the difference is most vaccinated people will be protected. Again, there's a small percentage of vaccinated people who will get sick and will die. And I don't care if it's one or two or three people out of a thousand. I don't like the odds. So I'm going to be careful for my personal health. But the main reason I'm wearing my mask and I'm keeping social distance and I'm going to just kind of <laughs> hang around at home again, I think, for a lot of the time, is on the public health side of the issue. I just don't want to be part of it. I don't want to be part of the spread. I don't want to be a conveyance for this virus. I forget who originated this, but it's been credited to several people. If, if you don't already understand... I can't explain to you why it's important to care about other people. I wish I could. If you can't understand that by now, that, that we need to care about each other, because the fact is you're going to spread it, whether or not you're vaccinated. And the unvaccinated are going to get sick and they're going to die by the thousands. And again, I'm just, I'm saying such Obvious things that have been said so many times, I'm almost embarrassed to have to repeat them. But children under 12 cannot yet get the vaccine. And this new Delta variant, and God knows what, what variant is ahead of us, that's even a more frightening thought. But the Delta variant that we know that scientists are learning about, it's a whole new ball game compared to where we were a year ago. Small children are getting this. They're susceptible. And too many of them are getting very sick. And too many of them are dying. So if you want to continue to hold up your don't tread on me flag and just cry liberty and choice, freedom of choice, and you want to go out and not wear a mask, not practice social distancing, live your full and free life, if that's still you, well, then you are contributing to the current death toll and the future death toll, which is going to just skyrocket again. 
unless we get our act together. I have to confess, uh, I'm usually a pretty optimistic guy. I'm not a rose-colored glasses kind of guy. No, uh, my optimism is born through my (laughs) righteous anger. And I fight for what I believe in, and I I holler about it here on the podcast. And uh, through that, that's where I get my optimism. It's like, we can do this. We really can do it. And I try to be... I try to be a cheerleader, but I'll confess, I'm pessimistic. I don't know how we get through this if a a great portion of people just aren't going to listen and they're not going to participate in the well-being of of their friends and neighbors and families, of their communities, the people they share, their city or town or state or country. If you can't understand your personal responsibility vis-a-vis public health, I don't know what else to tell you. It's very disheartening. It's very disappointing. My pessimism goes to the next step. Here's my biggest fear. And, and it, you know, maybe I'll swing a little bit like a pendulum. Maybe I'll have better days. But today, as we speak right now in the moment, I'm afraid this is just it now. This is, the pandemic is where we are. This is going to be a forever thing. I'll read, uh, somebody posted this in a little bit of sn- uh, snarky, sarcastic tone. Let me give him credit. Carl Hess. I don't know this person, but anyway. Don't worry. There won't be another lockdown. We'll just normalize dying from COVID like we've normalized dying from poverty, gun violence, police shootings, lack of housing, suicide, opioids, lack of access to medical care, etc., etc. I agree with this post. We have, as a society pretty much given up. I mean, yes, there are many great and wonderful people. There are scientists, there are researchers, there are medical personnel, there are uh, people in public office, all all sorts of people fighting. They're fighting to end poverty, to quell gun violence, to do something about police shootings, to do something about lack of affordable, safe housing, prevent suicides, do something about the opioid crisis trying to get universal health care. Sure, lots of good people doing good things. But as a whole, where, where, where are we? This post is right. To a large extent, we've normalized these things. Well, that's just how people are going to die. That's just all there is to it. What can you do? Can't give up our freedom. We can't give up our economy. It's just, it is what it is. And now, I, I, COVID and whatever variant it comes next after Delta, I'm afraid it's just going to fall onto that list. And as a society, as a country, as a nation, as a world, I don't know, we're just going to say, okay, well, people die of COVID every year. And if it's a 10,000 or 100,000 or 600,000, who knows where that number is going to fall. Remember, remember when Senator Ron Johnson at the beginning of this thing said, well, it's only 1% of the people who are going to die. And... Yeah, Ron Johnson's an idiot, but he knows that 1% of 300 million is 3 million people. He knows that. He's not that dumb. He came right out and said it. You can find the tape. He didn't care if 3 million people die. That's all right. It's it's the cost of uh, maintaining our lifestyle, our economy, our consumption, our, our freedom to go out to restaurants and bars. That's more important. 3 million people dying? Eh, eh. That's acceptable. That's all right. I'm afraid that's where we are now. It was very similar. It's very similar to climate crisis. There's just not enough people who care. And it's just, it's too late to do anything about it. We've got a large enough cohort of the people among us who are driving this train right off the cliff. Our best intentions are of no avail. Because as long as that cohort is large enough, they are calling the shots. The current spike in COVID hospitalizations and deaths will continue to rise until they make the decision. And in a very real sense, it's exactly analogous to climate crisis. Not enough people care. Not enough people are willing to do what needs to be done. And we just, uh, those of us who do care, just stand by and watch. 
We can do everything we can in our personal lives. We can lobby, we can vote, we can engage in activism, even civil disobedience. Well, okay. Now, that little string of words, <laughs> it, <laughs> it brought back just a, a little hint of optimism in my mood. Because there are things we can do. You can see I'm trying really hard to stay optimistic. If you're feeling like I am, this is going to be a little pep talk for all of us. If we're feeling like, like there's nothing we can do. On, on COVID, I've told you what I'm doing. I'm assuming everybody I come in contact with, in public anyway, I'm assuming you have it. And I'm acting accordingly. I'm masking, I'm social distancing. And I'm going to stay home pretty much most of the time. I don't care about my quote-unquote freedom. I just don't, I don't want to be part of the problem. As for climate crisis, there are things we can do. And the first is divest. The strategy of divestment is very powerful. And in our personal lives, and I, and I know that's not the answer. I'll get to that in a second. We, we talked about this the other day. But at least, at the very least, do no harm. Divest from, and that means withdraw your financial support in every possible way. Consume less, drive fewer miles. If you're in a situation where you live in a city and you can get around on public transportation, that's great. By the way, the current fight over the infrastructure bill, one of the, one of the big uh, points of contention is that Democrats want to emphasize public transportation and Republicans want to emphasize roads and bridges. In other words, cars, fossil fuel consumption. Because they know their voters are more suburban, more rural, and that speaks to them. Even though it doesn't speak to the issue of climate crisis, even though it doesn't acknowledge the fact that the Democratic Party's constituents out outnumber the Republican Party constituents, that's why all the voter suppression laws. So everything, every, any reasonable objective look at this says, yeah, you want to emphasize public transportation over private. There we go again. Public versus private. If, if you've got it embedded in your mind that somehow all public decisions are bad and all private decisions are good, you are so completely and thoroughly brainwashed into that idea of free market capitalism, and it's all about the individual. If liberty and freedom are your only calling cards, we've talked about this on the show before, it's supposed to be a balance. The founding fathers understood that, and they were damn slaveholders. But even they understood this, <laughs> that it's a, it's a balancing act. It has been from the beginning of this nation, from the beginning of this whole revolution of democracy around the world. It's a balance between liberty and justice, between the good of the community and the good of the individual. Both have to be taken into account. If you're only preaching freedom, if you're only preaching liberty, you don't understand how this country is supposed to work. You don't understand the founders. You don't understand the French Revolution. You don't understand the birth of democracy in Greece. <laughs> Any other example around the globe and throughout history where self-governance has been a goal. You don't get it. If you're just preaching liberty, if you got all of your chips on that color, you're going to lose. Because you or somebody close to you, and eventually all of us, are going to be done in by either the pandemic or the damn climate crisis. If you have no sense at all of community well-being and your responsibility in that well-being. If you don't get that, then you're doomed, and you are sentencing us to your fate. So thanks a lot. So if you want to go down fighting, <laughs> which I do, well, I don't want to go down. But if, if we are going down, I'm going to go down fighting. And if our fighting somehow turns this ship around, all the better. So divest from all things contributing to climate crisis. Change the way you travel. Change the way you work. Change the way you consume. Do it. Now, of course, as we've said many times, that's not enough. That's not enough because the great majority of people are doing a very small amount of damage compared to 
And it was just the other day, yesterday, day before, when we talk about this, that top 10% doing most of the damage to the, to the world, to the environment. Multinational corporations doing most of the damage. Governments of large nations, rich nations, doing most of the damage by far. So we can't do it unless they join us. So we have to force them. Let me correct myself. <laughs> They're never going to do it. It's the nature of the beast. We have to take their power. So that's where it gets political. Yes, adjust your own consumption. It's just the right thing to do just because it is. But even if all 90% of us below that top 10%, if we all do it, it's not going to, it's not going to make a difference unless we take their power. We have to take away the power of that top 10% income wise, wealth wise. We got to take away the power of the multinational corporations. Stop giving them your money to the greatest extent you can. You got to, you got to make everything local. You got to boycott pretty much every corporation. There are a hundred different things you can do. But the most important thing is to get political, to get radical, to get revolutionary, because it's never going to happen until we take the power from the top. Rich people, we got to just go grab their money, whatever it takes. We got to, we got to tax them. We got to have a huge wealth tax. We got to just take their money, man. They earned it off of our backs. It's our money. We created the wealth. Labor creates wealth. You know, you know, you know. It's going to take civil disobedience. It's going to take civil disruption. Peaceful, yes, always peaceful, but disruptive, yes, as well. Demand that power. Grab that power. This is a cliche, but it's true. Nobody gives up power. Nobody grants power. It's only taken. So we have to take the power from the top, economically, politically. And I'll just mention this very quickly because we talked about it, you and I, at length. But just to repeat, the first people to defeat politically are the moderates, are the centrists. They're the ones allowing this to continue. No progress has ever, ever come through compromise. That's a lie. That's a myth. Don't believe it. Progress only comes through political and economic victory. Walking that center line, compromising at every step, that only perpetuates the status quo. I'm looking out my window right now at the skyline of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and it's hazy. And it's been hazy for over a week because the jet stream is bringing smoke from West Coast fires. They're absolutely sweeping the nation. We're living in the dystopia we feared. So if we're going to go down, let's at least go down fighting. And then who knows? Who knows? Maybe we'll make a nice little comeback if we fight hard enough. Maybe if, if enough anti-vaxxers start dying off, people in their own families, in their own circles, start dying off by great numbers. Maybe, and there has been some indication that there's a little hint of a turnaround. Some anti-vaxxers up until this point are, are finally seeing the light. It's very small numbers, very small percentages, but the, the data is there to show that, yeah, there's maybe a little hint of a turnaround. All right, let's pin our hopes on that. Let's keep fighting for it. In the smoke from the fires I mentioned just a couple seconds ago, they're telling us now that it's even more toxic than we originally knew. Happened to see a little uh, blurb here from National Geographic recently, and uh, it's behind a paywall, so I can't get to it right now. I can't read it to you. But the, the gist of it was... It's even more dangerous than we realized. People with asthma, people with respiratory conditions are really at, in danger. It's altering lives right now, today, in this moment as you and I speak. It's not 10, 20, 30, 50 years down the road. It's happening right now. It's impacting people's lives. Coastal cities around the globe are already making plans for when the uh, sea rises another few inches or another couple of feet over the next few years and uh, decades. But it's quite a fight. It's quite a fight we have in front of us. The other thing about progress, and you can point to a couple of examples, uh, same-sex marriage, 
the decriminalization and the legalization of cannabis. Those are just two examples of issues where the numbers just shifted bit by bit by bit every year until we reach that proverbial tipping point, and then it just falls off the cliff. Everybody, well, okay, <laughs> same-sex marriage. Sure, we still have, of course, we have a whole uh, radical right-wing fascist Republican Party who wants to fight it, but they have the uphill battle on that one. And <laughs> cannabis legalization is across the spectrum. Libertarians like the idea, conservatives like the idea, liberals and progressives like the idea. So we see this climb, the steady climb, and then the big tipping point. Well, maybe, okay, let's, let's try to end the show optimistically. Maybe if we fight hard enough and we yell loud enough, and maybe if we reach that tipping point on COVID and on climate crisis, these existential life and death problems. And here's my optimistic thought to close the show today. Maybe we can reach a tipping point where enough of us say, okay, we got to do something about this. And then <laughs> we welcome with open arms our new converts. If they want to come over to our side, we're not going to scold them. We're not going to say, you're not welcome in our club because you've been the bad guys too long. No, we're going to say, welcome. Come on over. We're having a meeting tonight and we're going to hit the streets and we're going to occupy buildings and we're going to demand change. And the more the merrier. Wouldn't that be fantastic if we had this big groundswell of enthusiasm? Because the news just became overwhelming. Oh, hell, we're dying. We're killing each other. We're killing ourselves. I see the light. <laughs> and we'll have the tipping point. How great would that be? Because that's the thing about tipping points. You're never quite sure where they're, when they're going to come. You see the progress that inches along, inches along, as two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back, and you're Sisyphus rolling that boulder up the hill, and you think, oh, this is never going to be any better. But then, when no one could predict the exact moment, but that tipping point happens. So let's leave with that optimistic thought today. On COVID, on climate crisis, we need to hope for this tipping point sooner rather than later. If you're the type of person who prays, please pray for it. And most importantly, let's all fight for it every day, both in our personal relationship with the economy, with the earth, with each other. And let's fight for it on a public level where we advocate, where we activate. And as distasteful as it is for a lot of people, there's no option anymore. You have to get political. You have to get revolutionary. There's no other way to do it. We're not going to wish our way out of this. So calling all bandwagon jumpers, you are invited to this party. Boom. All right. There it is. I love you. I'm Charles Purcell. <laughs>